with that, I will get started. And uh, um, great. So we've talked about the diversity of the uh, microbiome. I think we also have to keep in mind when we talk about cancer that we have to consider the diversity of cancer. Um, we tend to use it very much as a single term, but um, to remind ourselves that this is a class of over 100 different diseases, although they share a very common um, set of um, sequelae, that is uncontrolled growth, invasion that um, can um, in intrude upon and destroy adjacent tissues, and in some cases result in metastasis or spreading to other locations in the body um, via various circula circulatory systems. Um, in all cases, it starts from modifications in single cells, which can then um, go on to contribute to loss of normal growth, um, loss of control of replication processes, and over time, there's an accumulation of numerous other genetic alterations that um, can contribute to tumorigenesis. So in this context, there are a number of possibilities, at least from the standpoint of thinking about environmental exposures, um, whether they be occupational, diet, water-based, whatever. Um, pretty much at every one of those little white arrows in the trajectory where various exposures could affect the process. And um, in the context of some of the cellular processes that we think of as being important with regards to cancer, um, when we think about exposures in their sort of to totality, and particularly, for example, in the context of nutrition, which is a very complex exposure and diet, um, we can identify um, an impact of these various constituents on all of these different processes, whether or not they be specifically at the cellular level from the standpoint of effects on proliferation and apoptosis, um, cellular differentiation, immune function, I've heard some discussion about that already this morning, um, but also in, a, in the context on a systemic level, handling of carcinogens in general, metabolism of hormones, and in relation to today's discussion, um, for each one of these, we can also consider that the microbial um, metabolism and the microbes themselves can play a role um, with regards to, to many of these. Um, some of them may be direct effects with regards um, to signal transduction effects, for example, in relation to the cellular events. Others are more of a maybe a modifying effect, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, the, some examples there. Um, going back to what Dr. Young's comment with regards to um, our view of microbes, it typically has been sort of the one bug, one disease approach, um, but it has helped us to identify uh, several microbes that are, um, have been identified as causal agents with regards to cancer, and um, the estimate is about 20% of cancers worldwide can be attributed to um, infections, uh, viral infections in the context of um, cervical and um, liver cancer, and uh, predominantly Helicobacter pylori and with regards to gastric cancer. Um, some of these effects can be direct. They can also, this is kind of a mushy sort of description of how you th think about um, these microbes, but the potential to interact direct, directly with the cellular processes um, may be a, a contribution there. But I think particularly with regards to today's discussion, we really have to think about them as additional modifiers, both of our own physiology, as well as modifiers of the exposures themselves um, in their capacity to metabolize um, possible carcinogens, metabolism of various identified chemopreventive agents, and then, as we heard from Dr. Vijay Kumar, the potential to affect energetics and exposure to um, and how, how we interact with, with the, uh, the calories that we're exposed to. Um, certainly, Helicobacter pylori has been the poster bug of um, infection and cancer um, from the standpoint of, of a bacteria, and that has been identified as a causal factor in gastric adenocarcinoma, um, with the um, effects being that chronic con colonization um, results in inflammation, and ultimately ulceration. 
I think one of the things to always keep in mind is that only a fraction of colonized individuals ever go on to develop gastric cancer, even though in some populations, very high um, percentage of the population may be um, colonized with, with the bacteria. Um, there are many different strains of Helicobacter pylori, so depending on the type of strain that a person is exposed to, um, will also have an effect as we start to understand um, the specifics there. But at the same time, most mammals carry various um, Helicobacter pylori strains, and um, we've lived with this bacteria for many, many, many thousands of years. Um, the flip side of this is if we look at the prevalence of um, Helicobacter pylori um, colonization with regards to the esophageal adenocarcinoma story, it's a little different. Um, esophageal adenocarcinoma has been increasing as um, gastric cancer has been decreasing. And um, in a meta-analysis several years ago, um, they looked at the risk of um, both adenocarcinoma, um, Barrett's esophagus, which is a precursor um, syndrome to um, adenocarcinoma, as well as squamous cell carcinoma. And um, this forest plot, what you see is that in the individual, in the studies that looked at the adenocarcinoma, um, the, um, in the prevalence, or excuse me, the um, risk of adenocarcinoma was actually decreased in individuals or in the, the uh, populations con containing the Helicobacter pylori. Um, this was also the case for Barrett's. It was not the case for squamous cell um, cancer. So in the, as you look at the little purple um, turquoise and um, pinkish um, summary um, triangles, it gives you an indication that there's less disease um, on the left-hand side and more disease on the right, and for both um, adenocarcinoma and Barrett's, you see a decrease, which I think this is sort of, a, we don't understand this, um, but it's a really a reminder that we need to consider that if you think about eradicating something because it's associated with one possible disease, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to solve all the world's problems and that the potential for having an impact on another equally devastating disease is of concern. So I think this is um, one of those areas where we, as we move forward and, and make decisions there, we have to be careful. Um, another um, bacteria that's received attention is Streptococcus bovis um, and potential relation to colon cancer. This is a, a gut microbe that's present in about 15, 5 to 16% um, of um, adults. Um, it's been associated with septicemia and endocarditis. And by way of association, um, because of the strong association between S. bovis, bacteremia, um, and colorectal cancer, the um, next step has been, well, maybe it's associated with um, colon cancer. However, as um, I think Dr. Young pointed out, one of our biggest problems in this field is that we do not have um, data that allow us to determine causality. That in this case, usually what you find is that you're looking at individuals who are cases, that is, they already have colon cancer, and you compare them to individuals who do not. And um, by that point, you may already have enough damage to the colon that this is allowed for S. bovis to um, be present in circulation, and therefore you're measuring it. So this issue of temporality of being able to show that um, S. bovis was there prior to development of cancer is, is a problem. Experimentally, there are a number of studies that have showed that, um, you know, biologically this could be plausible. Um, the uh, microbes been shown to promote inflammation. Um, it upregulates COX-2 in epithelial cells in vitro, which is a hallmark of inflammation in relation to um, colorectal cancer risk, and has been shown to be carcinogenic in a rat model of, of colon tumorigenesis. So a number of pieces of the puzzle are there, but our biggest problem, I think, is with regards to the temporality of, of the human data. Um, well, those were individual microbes, but we're here to talk about um, the microbiome and what its potential risk is, effect is on cancer risk. 
Um, some of the explanations that have been given, um, won't go through to these in too much detail since they've been talked about on several levels. Um, but the idea that you can potentially outcompete less desirable bacteria, um, certainly the interaction with the mucosal associated immune system, um, potential for regulating tight junctions, which affect the um, um, spaces between the epithelial cells and uh, affect the mucosal barrier function. Um, this is an area that's receiving a lot of attention, as well as direct effect on various signal transduction pathways. And with regards to the question of um, the microbiome with regards to cancer risk, um, probably the, the um, most attention has been pl played to the gut microbiota, um, partly just because you can't ignore it. Um, it's certainly there. And, um, but even though um, it's this huge number of organisms, it really only accounts for six major phyla of all of the, ba um, the bacterial phyla. And of those, about 90% are Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes. So on a, a grand level, there, there is um, not a lot of diversity, but the diversity is really at the species level. And this is where um, we see with regards to a lot of the pyrosequencing work and um, high throughput approaches that where we see a lot of the variation among individuals um, in different studies and across studies. Um, so what do we know about the gut microbiome and cancer risk in humans? Um, we are, at this point, we don't know a lot. Um, we do know that in, with regards to other um, chronic diseases, that there may be differences in community structure that could be related to um, adverse health outcomes. For example, with regards to diabetes, certainly irritable bowel, or excuse me, um, inflammatory bowel disease and in the area of obesity, there are recognized differences, um, which experimentally you can show shifts as a result of, um, and um, <coughs> severity of disease as a result of this. Um, it, with regards to cancer, um, there are several studies that have shown that the human gut microbial community differs between individuals who have colorectal cancer and, the, and individuals do, who do not. Similarly, between individuals who have colorectal adenomas and individuals with a clean colon. The problem with all of these studies is that they're case control studies. So at, by the time an individual has been diagnosed with the disease or been diagnosed with adenoma, we don't know what all the other components are that have changed with regards to diet, with regards to other factors. Um, as far as epithelial damage, et cetera, that may be contributing to changes in the microbial population. Um, so I think what's really lacking here are the prospective in studies in humans that would really allow us to link changes in the gut microbiome to onset of cancer. Um, I work closely with epidemiologists, and for many years I've been encouraging them to add poop samples to the collection of biologic specimens that they have their various cohorts collecting. Of course, that's not something that goes over really well, but it, we, we would be so much further ahead if people had started this, you know, 10 years ago, um, because we would then be able to start to um, interrogate some of those samples and um, um, determine whether or not there is a, a potentially a causal relationship there. So um, since it's before lunch and since my background's in nutrition, um, we have to talk about food. And I think this um, diagram from Ruth Lay does a lovely job of showing how our diet impacts our um, microbiome. And this is looking at a variety of different species, um, herbivores in green, omnivores in blue, and carnivores in red, um, showing that based on your choice of diet, you tend to cluster with those individuals. Your gut microbiome clusters with those individuals who are groups of mammals that typically are consuming the same kinds of things. We can do a similar thing looking at vegans against uh, you know, omnivores and humans. Um, it's not nice, quite as beautiful, but certainly it shows that, that the diet is really influencing the, uh, the gut microbiome. And 
this is definitely a two-way street here from a sort of the exposure-centric um, view of the world um, with thinking about diet as being an important factor with regards to um, tumorigenesis. Um, we have a number of factors that we consider being important, um, both from a standpoint of specific dietary constituents, whether they are potentially chemopreventive where, or whether or not they're carcinogenic, as well as the issue of fuel availability. Um, Dr. Vijay Kumar pointed out that ob obesity is becoming a huge problem in uh, many Western countries. And tracking with that are also the issues of the effects of obesity on risk for cancer, and that it is a risk factor for um, a number of different cancers. So the other piece of this is the interaction then with the gut bacteria, not only with regards to fuel availability, um, but also in relation to metabolism of dietary constituents, and I'll show some examples of that. Um, we've heard about potential of, for direct effect on the um, um, cellular processes related to tumor genesis. And then the other piece is the direct effect of the diet on the gut um, microbiome and the impact of um, food choices with regards to what um, the microbial community looks like. So if we think about this from the standpoint of um, the gut microbes view of the world, um, sitting down there in the colon waiting for breakfast, lunch, and dinner to arrive, um, you know, I often think you're far better off being a rumen bacteria than you are being a, you know, a, in a mammalian gut where you're at the back end of it because um, essentially what the gut microbes receive with regards to nutrients are really what we can't process. Um, we have a, we're very efficient at handling a number of um, nutrient from the standpoint of carbohydrate, protein, fat, et cetera, on various levels, depending on how well we process something, how well we chew it, et cetera. Um, so that really that will determine then what's available for bacterial metabolism. And so really the gut microbial metabolism focuses on a number of processes that um, are working with what's left over. Fermentation of non-starch polysaccharides that we cannot digest. Um, night trait reduction, sulfate reduction, hydrolysis of a whole bunch of um, various glycosides, as well as um, glucuronide conjugates. There was some discussion earlier um, in, the, in this morning's session about um, handling of, of, um, of hormones. In many cases, the um, beta-glucuronidases in that the microbes have are very important with regards to enteropathic recirculation of steroid hormones, androgens, estrogens, et cetera. And that it's really through that um, hydrolysis of the glucuronide that results in uh, reuptake of the, of the steroid hormones and um, effects there. So when we think about, in this case then, the potential for the gut bacteria to um, modify the diet and disease relationship, it's really through the handling of various constituents of diet and um, the impact then downstream on both the colonic epithelium as well as potentially um, more distal um, tissues with regards to disease risk. So sort of taking it from the lower cancer risk story in the context of dietary exposures that typically are thought of as either being possibly preventive or at best not a big problem, um, certainly dietary fiber and uh, resistant starch, other um, um, carbohydrates that are available to gut bacteria, um, the, production, the fermentation of production and short chain fatty acids such as propionate um, and butyrate, acetate. Um, butyrate is a major substrate for the colonic epithelium um, and integrity of the colonic epithelium um, and can decrease inflammation locally and um, in, that, in that regard is considered to be you know, a positive um, substrate. The other piece um, with regards to um, bacterial handling is sort of, and this is very global with a sort of phytochemical umbrella um, term here, but um, most of the plant compounds that we are exposed to undergo bacterial metabolism. Um, many of the things that we can measure systemically in humans 
do not exist in the plants themselves. It's really the uh, metabolism by the gut microbes that contributes to a bioactive compound that then um, may be um, beneficial to us. Some of the examples of these include the isoflavone, um, isoflavones found in soy, um, and I think uh, Dr. Van de Veel will be talking a little bit about um, some of the other phytoestrogenic compounds there. Another example are the glucosinolates in cruciferous vegetables. Among all the vegetables that have been evaluated with regards to potential chemopreventive effects, um, cruciferous veggies such as broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage have really been the ones that keep standing out. The way these compounds, the glucosinolates, exist in the plant food, these are not bio biologically active and have to undergo hydrolysis for the removal of the carbohydrate moiety to allow for production of a, a bioactive um, compound, the isothiocyanates. So again, um, in that case, the bacteria play an important role. Um, certainly, on the flip side of this, there are a number of constituents of diet that are concerned from an um, increased cancer standpoint. Um, fat resulting in increased um, output of primary bile acids um, from the gallbladder can be acted on by um, clostridia and a number of other um, organisms to result in secondary bile acids, which have um, inflammatory um, properties. Um, protein or amino acid degradation, again, um, particularly sulfur amino acids, sulfur containing amino acids, um, are the sulfate from that is reduced to um, hydrogen sulfide, um, which has been shown in a number of experimental mo models to be um, and um, have an inflama inflammatory effect and also contribute directly to ulcerative colitis in some models. And um, the, uh, similarly with the nitrate reducers. Um, so by way of example, um, looking at production of isothiocyanates from glucosinolates and cruciferous veggies, um, if you ate all of your cruciferous vegetables raw, that's all your broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, etc., cetera, um, and chewed it really well, you would be exposed to very high concentrations of isothiocyanates, which is a good thing. Um, because the plant food, it's, the plant itself contains the enzyme myrosinase that can carry out this hydrolysis reaction. However, when you look around the world, there are very few cuisines where cruciferous vegetables are a raw vegetable. We usually cook them extensively. And as a result, we have to rely on our gut bacteria to carry out that hydrolysis step of the glucosidolate to the isothiocyanate, um, the thioglucose thioglucosidases um, carry out this reaction. Um, but I think one of the things that um, shows up nicely in, in this work of um, Tom Kensler's is the huge variation in the availability of these compounds um, across individuals. So this was a large um, randomized controlled trial looking at um, supplementation with a glucosinolate product. Um, in relation to trying to prevent formation of aflatoxin DNA addicts. It's the the uh, isothiocyanate is important in upregulation of um, glutathione as transferases, and therefore the idea was that you could prevent, um, you could handle the substrate, metabol you could metabolize the aflatoxin and therefore prevent um, addict formation. So what they found is that when they looked at the amount of isothiocyanate recovered in the urine from these individuals, which is a reflection of how much has been absorbed, only between 1 to 45 percent of the dose um, on a daily basis was being recovered in the urine, um, suggesting that either, one, it's not absorbed, or two, it's being handled by the gut microbes. And what they also found in, in the panel on the right is that individuals who had the highest um, urinary excretion of isothiocyanates had a lower amount of aflatoxin um, DNA addicts. So the potential for metabolism of the, of the precursor to contribute to um, downstream effects that may be important for um, cancer risk is an indication that we can't ignore the microbes in that regard. Um, on the flip side of this, um, here we are just ready, about ready for lunch and just what your microbes ordered, um, sources of uh, nitrates, various um, 
certainly meat sources, some water sources are also very high in nitrates. And the microbial nitrate reductase um, produces a wide number of N nitroso compounds, which can um, cause DNA addicts, DNA damage, et cetera. Um, a recent study um, that actually looked at the effects of controlled feeding, um, feeding controlled diets on N nitroso compound production, as well as um, looking at the microbial populations. And I think somebody mentioned this morning that while well, you can't control what people eat, well, many of us try to. And there are actually a, a number of very elegantly designed controlled feeding studies where you can bring everybody in, feed them all their food for X number of weeks, and evaluate various intermediate markers that may be important for cancer risk as well as other physiologic changes you may be interested in. So in this study, um, they were looking at a weight reduction diet that was a high protein, medium carb, that's the HPMC, um, against a high protein, low carb, the HPLC. Um, sorry to those of you who think of HPLC as something else. Um, <laughs> against a what they called a maintenance diet that they tested first. So if you look at the um, table on the bottom there, this is the percent of energy from protein, fat, and carb. And the maintenance diet is pretty normal for most um, Western diets. And then it's really a shift towards um, a more um, a high protein and then very high fat and high protein in the last one. And the um, Figure shows that with the increase in both protein and um, with protein as well as in the last case fat, you see a significant increase in um, total N nitroso compounds in uh, the fecal water um, from stool collected from these individuals. Um, at the same time, they also evaluated um, fecal microbial populations and showed that depending on which um, diet the individual was consuming, you see um, clustering of the um, specimens within, with regards to specific diet. Um, so the HPLC diet um, resulted in a, in a major shift with regards to um, the gut microbes. Also, there was a decrease in the proportion of butyrate in, in relation to the other short chain fatty acids in the stool, and a decrease in uh, using a proteomic approach or a metabolomic approach, a decrease in fiber derived phenolic acids, which, given the fact that the diet was extremely low in carbohydrate, probably meant that um, there was very little in the way of even uh, plant food sources in the context of that diet. Um, so, not too surprising that you would see a reduction there. But overall, again, showing the interact, interplay between the gut microbes and the dietary part. Um, one of the um, concerns has been, you know, where is all the action? And this is looking, um, taking a metagenomic approach, looking at what genes um, are uh, being expressed and what are the metabolic pathways in the gut microbiome that are most active. And as you can see, carbohydrate metabolism, amino acid, and xenobiotic uh, biodegradation are the ones that have been shown to be um, most prevalent. Which also brings up how do we go about looking at the gut microbiome? And I think others will talk a little bit more about this, but the idea that um, from a taxonomic standpoint, we see a huge amount of variation between individuals with regards to their various um, bacterial species. Um, but when we start to look at differences in relation to functional genes, which is the um, panel on the right, that actually um, functionally we have a lot of redundancy in the system and that in that context across this group of 18 individuals, we're pr relatively stable in relation to the, um, the number of functional genes that are present, um, which this may be an approach that would, will benefit fit us more in the context of trying to understand the diet. So where are we with regards to the microbiome and cancer? Um, I think this will come up again and again, which came first, the chicken or the egg. Um, in the context of this disease, this group of diseases, um, we lack prospective studies. Many of the studies that have been done have been small sample sizes um, with not very well characterized human populations as far as 
exposure to other um, environmental agents or diet, et cetera. And also, um, there's a desperate need for a good standardization of sample collection, storage, and testing. And I think what we'll find, and this will be definitely for discussion, is the need to be able to integrate various omics technologies beyond just um, the microbiome itself, but uh, moving into the meta genome of the whole um, microbial gene connection, um, proteomics as well as metabolomics, and um, sort of a no-brainer, but this certainly is going to require a strong collaborative effort on the part of um, a n number of different um, disciplines in order to be able to uh, tease out all these pieces. So just in summary, um, cancer risk is a combinatorial um, disease, risk is combinatorial definitely modified by bacterial factors as well as our response to those and the interactions. So you can flip this either way. The microbiome needs to be considered both in the context of the host exposures or the host exposures need to be considered in the context of the microbiome if we're going to be able to understand where to put our um, energies for risk reduction for cancer. Thank you.